6 and 38 says, Give. Jesus speaking here, give, and it will be given to you. Good man, press down, shake together, and running over with the your bosom. For it's the same measure that you use, and we measure back to you. How God loves a cheerful giver. I'm thankful that we can be a blessing to the community, to the world, and to our giving. How are you? Got that this morning? Got that ready? Got that ready? Got that ready? I had a room from upstairs. Let's all just get together and go on the floor. I work out. And just worship again. You know, Sunday morning service is Sunday morning worship service. So let's just take some time. You know, we all come in. We're like our house, so we got two little kids. So anytime we go anywhere, it seems like it's a mad dash. Just to get here.
trials no one. You know, we make the mistake all the time when these things, tests and trials happen in our lives. What do we instantly do? Don't we want to blame God for what's going wrong in our lives? Why, Father, have you placed these things upon me? But we see here, God does not tend nor try anyone with evil, does He? No, we know it's Satan. It's the thief who kills, steals, and destroys our enemy, our adversary. Satan or Lucifer, however you want to put it. But He is the one who tempts us. He is the one who tries us. And sometimes by our own dumb mistakes, <laughs> we are in trials and temptations. It's not all the time Satan. Sometimes it's our own foolishness. But whatever state we're in, these things are in our life. God is here to help us and get us out of these things, to lead us through these things, and to increase and better ourselves. He takes those things which Satan intends for good, and he uses it for our benefit. And we'll look at a little bit more of this. But keep in mind, we're going through these things. We're not staying in them, hallelujah. If we stay course, if we stay close to God, if we don't blame Him and falsely accuse Him for what's going on in our life, we will make it through. And when we look back, we'll see that the end result was well worth all that we went through. Now, hallelujah. James chapter 5, verse 1. James 5. You're already there, so just skip over a few chapters. James 5, 1. Come now. You rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupt, and your garments are moth-eaten. And your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaved up treasure in the last days. You know, in these last days, we can even see how that the gap between the rich and poor is exceedingly growing. The middle class is almost, if you will, whittling away, and we see the poor becoming poor, and don't we see the rich becoming richer? But this is, here we see him talking about these last days, bless God, and God recognizing these things. You know, God doesn't give you all these riches and things for you to store up for yourself. No, He gives them to you so that you can know share. He blesses you so you can be a blessing. But we know that, hey, there's a lot of people that's got a lot of money. There's nothing wrong with money. But it's the love of money. People misquote that, don't they? It's the love of money which is the root of all evil. It's not having money. Don't you need money to buy groceries, to buy fuel, to pay for your electricity, to pay for your heat and all these things? Yes. It takes money, but money having you is the problem. And money has got a lot of people. And they'd rather have money. They would take a few thousand dollars to teach you out of, you know, whatever it is. That's right, Isabel. But indeed, verse four, the wages of laborers who indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have which reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You know, your works, whatever you do, you know, is going to come back. You know, what those saying is what goes around comes around. We all heard that, right? I'm telling you, it's true. What you do today, you may get away with it for a little bit. You may cheat and steal and, and do all these things, but it's going to come back and it's going to get you one day if you don't make corrections and repent of your ways. It's going to come back to haunt you. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You might say, where are you going with all this? Just stay with me. <laughs> I'm encouraging you this morning because, you know, we go through things. We go through things financially. We go through things physically. But God notices all these things, and he's watching out for your good. You have lived on earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fat in your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Let's keep in mind that the word of God was given to who? To the church, which we are, the church, hallelujah. If you are saved, you're part of the church, and the Word of God is speaking to you. You also be patient. Establish. Everybody say establish. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's like I said, we see throughout the Bible how it confirms that the days that we're living in. All these signs and confirmations, we are living in the last days. And they even called it the last days 
back when they was writing these things. So how much closer are we now to these last days? I'm telling you, the coming of the Lord is at hand. He's coming shortly, hallelujah. And I'm glad that He's going to come for a glorious church. Amen. Not for some old hag. Bless God. We are the bride of Christ. And bless God, we're going where we need to get. Hallelujah. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Be sound. Be firm. Hallelujah. Decide that nothing is going to move you out of the will of God. Regardless of circumstances or situations, you're going to be firm and you're going to stand. Even though people may be falling to your right and to your left, bless God, you've chose to make the stand in faith to let nothing shake you nor move you out of God's plan for your life. You're going to accomplish His will for your life regardless if anybody else does or not. That's what we have to purpose in our hearts. We have to realize that we are in a race. Things are against us. Sometimes things get hard. Sometimes things don't work out the way we think they should work out. But establish yourself. Why? Because God is watching over us. We're going through them. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Doesn't the Bible give us plenty of examples of suffering and patience throughout the Word of God? Yes, it does. And we've seen some that fall, don't we? We see some that make the wrong choices, and we see some that make the right choices. Those who stay with God and stick through it, aren't their end better than their beginning? Yes, it is, and that was given for your example. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Hallelujah. That's the God I serve, a compassionate and merciful God. You know, God isn't up there in heaven with a fly swatter just waiting for me to make a wrong move so he can swap me with it. Amen? Amen? But we've got this misconception. All these bad things in our lives that are happening, God placed them upon us. And he's just waiting and just can't wait just to abuse me. We need to renew our mind with the Word of God because that's not what the Word of God tells us. Matter, But it tells us just the opposite, doesn't it? Just as she's the sister sung this morning. God is good, and God is good all the time. Hallelujah. So we've heard of the perseverance of Job. So let's look at Job. So I think many of you know where I'm going this morning, don't you? We're going to the book that bears his name, Job. That wasn't hard to figure out, was it? Job chapter 1 and verse 1. So we're going to look at Job. And there's no better example in the Bible about a man enduring under temptations and trials than Job. He went through some stuff, amen? He was given for example. Many people want to blame God for what happened to Job. That isn't what the Word says. We're going to look at that this morning. Job 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. How would like to live in Uz? Where do you live at, Uz? I live in Uz, cuz. Whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright. And one who reverently feared God... Everybody say, fear God. fear God. And abstained from and shunned evil because it was wrong. Job's success came, why? Because he feared God. He recognized and respected God and His commandments. You know the commandment we have today is love. Is love, the commandment of love. If we're in the commandment of love and we walk in love, we're walking in fear to God. We're loving the brethren because he first us, first loved us. We're going to be obedient to his word. Job was blessed because he walked in the commandments of God. You're going to be blessed and you are blessed, but in order for you to walk in those blessings, you must walk in the commandment of love. So are you in love? I, I don't know. You have to ask that question and answer that question for yourself. But I guarantee you one thing, you're not going to walk in God's blessings until you begin walking in love. But going on. And there was born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very great body of servants, so that this man was the greatest of all men of the East. Keep in mind these days that your livestock and your land was your wealth. 
You know, they didn't have dollar bills back then. Matter of fact, how they survived, they traded and bartered in these things. So your possessions was your wealth. So Job was a wealthy man. Verse 4. His sons used to go and feast in the house each on his day, birthday in turn. And they invited their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed or disowned God in their hearts. This, though, this did Job... This did Job at all such times. You know, Job, Job was concerned about walking rightly before God, he and his family, because he feared God. He recognized his authority and power, hallelujah. And he knew that if he wanted to stay in his blessings, he had to stay in line with God and fellowship with him. But what happens when persecution comes to us? Don't we just want to turn away from God? Just the opposite. Let's look at Job. Now there was a day when the sons... The angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, everybody say Satan. The adversary and accuser also came along, came, also came along with them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where did you come? Then Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Doesn't the Bible say Satan is like a roaring lion, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? So this is just once again confirmed. Satan wanders to and from the earth, seeking someone weak, seeking somebody who he can get one over and cause harm to. Someone, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to kill you. He wants to ruin it. He wants to make a mockery of you and your family. So that's what Satan was doing. He's going to and from the earth, seeking someone whom he may devour. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who reverently fears God and abstains from and shuns evil because it is wrong? And Satan answered the Lord, Does Job reverently fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have conferred prosperity and happiness upon him, and the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. God was protecting Job, wasn't he? He was protecting Job from the evil one. But what does Satan ask God? We see in verse 11. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. You know, Satan is a tempter and Satan is a liar. You know, when... Jesus, when he came and tempted Jesus, he tried to get Jesus to do many things that were against God's will, didn't he? Then he tried to get Jesus in error. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. We see here he's asking God, he's tempting God to do something which he doesn't do. I don't think many of us have seen that before because we go on and let's read. He's asking God to do something that's against God's will. Because we see in verse 12, and people say, look at this. Well, God caused all these problems to happen to Job. And we see things that happen in this life. We see weather. We see famine, pestilence. We see wars. And then we say, you know, God's in control. You know, God's causing all these things to happen for a reason. Haven't we all heard that? Verse 12 tells us what my father, your father, says to Satan. And the Lord said to Satan, the adversary and the accuser, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon the man himself putting up forth your hand. Whose hand? Who did he say not to put forth his hand? Satan. He said, All that Job has is in your power now. In other words, God says, I'm going I'm to remove my hands from Job. But nowhere does it tell us that God struck Job. No, it tells us that he removed his protection from Job and says, Satan, now he's in your hands. But upon the man himself put not forth your hand, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Satan struck and put all these things against Job. It wasn't God the Father. It wasn't God the Father. 
God took his protection from Job. And we see here what happened when he was turned over to Satan. What happened when, when, when God's protection was removed from Job and Satan had a heyday in his life. Well, we see starting in verse 13 what happened. It's not God that's causing these things in your lives, people. It's the enemy. And there was a day when Job's sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house on his birthday. And there came a messenger of Job and said, The oxen were pounding, the donkey, donkeys feeding beside them, and this, somebody swooped down upon them and took away the animals. Indeed, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God, or he could say lightning. That's another description. It's not saying that it came from God. It's just using his description of lightning. Lightning has fallen from the heavens and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Keep in mind, isn't he under now what Job has under the hand or in the hands of Satan, right? This isn't God striking him in these things with lightning. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans divided into three bands and made a raid upon the camels and have taken them away. Yes, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, they came a great whirlwind from the desert. You know what this implies to me? That Satan is able to use the weather. Has anyone ever seen that before? Maybe you've never looked at that before. Maybe that opened your eyes this morning. We want to blame God for everything that's going. He's for us, not against us, people. We need to renew our minds. And smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and rent his robe and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshipped. Think about it, and worshipped. And worshipped. Many people would have cursed God, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they? Think about that. All that you've had in a moment's time. Your sons and your daughters, your possessions, gone in the instant. You know what? Nobody promises you tomorrow, do they? You know, this life is so short and the things that we have. But man, you know, possessions, but your own children. Oh, man. But we want to blame God. God, why? But Job worshipped, hallelujah, and said, Naked, without possessions I came into this world from my mother's womb. And naked without the possessions shall I depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, praised, and magnified and worshipped be the name of the Lord. And all this, listen, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He did not charge God foolishly. He didn't blame God for all these things that were happening to him. But we want to do just the opposite. We want to blame God. Don't blame God. But what were Job's possessions before Satan came in and wreaked, wreaked havoc in his life? We see here he had seven sons and three daughters. Possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very great body of servants. Most Bible, Bible scholars agree that from the time Satan began to afflict Job and his household till we see in, in uh, chapter 42, the last book of Job, was about a period of 9 to 12 months. So about a year. So his trials and tribulations was a year. Some people want to believe that, that Job had all these things upon him for a great length of time. Now, a year, by all means, don't get me wrong, that would take some enduring, especially the bulls and the things that happened to Job. But he never cursed God. He never cursed God. But he went a year through tests and trials. He went through some tests and trials, and I would say extreme tests and trials. But let's go to 42 and 10. We'll look at Job's possessions Afterwards, after all these things happened, what did you say, Brett? Job forty-two, forty-two ten, and Lord, everybody say Lord. Lord. 
Say it again. Lord. Say it again. Lord. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad we serve the same Lord? Amen. I am. Turn the captivity. Bless God. God is not a destroyer, but He is a restorer. Amen. Hallelujah. Our God doesn't kill, steal, and destroy. He gives life and gives it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice. Everybody say twice. Twice, twice as much as he had before. Satan killed, still destroyed his livelihood and his family. And him going through these things, God in his goodness and his grace, graciousness restored twice as much than he had before. He just didn't restore what he had, but he gave him an abundance in a, in a greater measure of what he had before. God is a giver, hallelujah. Yeah. You know, he took this old sinner, bless God, that deserved punishment, gave his only son for us, that we may have life, but not only life, but life in abundance, hallelujah, in this world. He gave us salvation, which is wholeness, spirit, soul, and body, glory to God. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who known him before. They prayed with him in his house and they sympathized with him and covered him over all the distressing calamities. It says that the Lord had brought upon him. But we see here, once again, God did not punish him. Rather, God took his hedge away. Let's not get that confused. He just removed his hedge. Satan is the one that afflicted these things upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every man an earring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For in his latter days, we see he had, what, 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first, Jemiah, and the name of the second, Kazai, and the name of the third, Karen Hapaka. And in all the land, there was no woman so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived a hundred and forty years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even to four generations. So Job died an old man of full days. So for one year of torment, by him staying faithful to God, gave him what? Twice as much, same amount of sons and daughters, and a hundred and forty years of living and the double blessings of God. I would say that one year of temptation didn't compare to the 140 years of double blessings, did it? Do you? Then he lived old and fulfilled his life. And lived well. As God rewards faithfulness, doesn't he? He always does. Hallelujah. He rewards faithfulness. But, but I'm, you know, I'm a daughter. I got... I'm not a daughter. I'm a father. <laughs> But I have two beautiful daughters myself. You know, I can imagine, you know, Job losing them. But then once being restored to having these three beautiful daughters. And they were precious. You know, I'm sure Job now cherished his children in a way that he didn't before. Sometimes you don't know what you have until you're young. We've all heard that, haven't we? Let's cherish what we have. You know, our wives, our spouses, our children. Enjoy their presence now because we don't realize... Seems like a lot of times we take those things for granted until they're gone, hallelujah. Make the most of every day. Make the most with your spouses. Make the most with your family and friends. Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow, hallelujah. But we are guaranteed, bless God, a reunion. Amen. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord, which is far better, hallelujah. We pass, we don't, as Christians, you know what? We never die. We just pass into this life into the next life. Though these temptations and things, they may hurt, we may endure them for a season, but bless God, they don't compare nothing. We may be tested, we may be tried, our faith may be tested and tried, but it's so insignificant compared to eternity walking in hand in hand with God in eternal bliss. It's incomparable. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm looking forward to it. How about you? Those that have gone on before me, though we may miss them in the flesh, they're far better, hallelujah. Far better. You know what? They wouldn't come back if they could. Wouldn't come back if they could. But we see that Job so loved his daughters, he gave them inheritance among their brothers. You know this was unheard of in this day? 
But he did. He loved them so much, cherished them so much, he even gave them an inheritance. Let's look at these daughters. Because these daughters' names are significant in what God did in Job's life. Jemiah, which I'm probably butchering these names, but I think you all know I'm well known for doing that, means dove. And throughout the scriptures, even in our society today, we see that the dove represents a symbol of peace. And then we see Kazi is another spelling of the word Kasi. And we remember that when the wise man brought gifts to Jesus, they brought gifts of Kazi, aloes, and myrrh, which these are all expensive and rare incenses or fragrances. But they are expensive, rare, and beautiful. So this Kazi is translated incense or fragrance. And then we see Karen Hapaka, butcher that as well, literally means the horn of adornment. So it refers to the outward beauty that comes from an inward character. So through the daughters of Job and these names, we see that they represent peace, fragrance, and beauty. These are the fruits of Job's trials. Hallelujah. All that came that he went through, these were the end results. Peace, fragrance, and beauty. Hallelujah. Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to joy. Peace. Everybody say peace. With God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, Hallelujah, my Savior, glory to God. Through Him also we have our access, interest, introduction by faith into this grace, state of God's favor, in which we firmly and safely stand. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope and our experience and joy in the glory of God. Moreover, let us be full of joy now. Bless God, God doesn't just want us to go through this life miserable. And then we live happily in the afterlife. No, God wants our joy full now. Well, let's walk in that joy. You know, when we have God's peace within us, we can smile. We can laugh even in the tests and trials of life. We're not laughing because we feel like it, but we're laughing in faith because we know that the end results are going to work out to our good and are going to be better. Hallelujah. Bless God, your faith is going to be pure. It's going to be stronger. Just like as gold, as we read about, when it is brought through fire, it's pure, it's worth more. Bless God, your life is going to be worth more to yourself, to your family, to others through these things. What Satan uses for good, for bad, God turns around and uses for your good. Hallelujah. Let us exalt and triumph in our troubles. Whew, boy, and it takes faith, don't it? When the body is going through sickness, when our family is going through things, it takes some effort for us to exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings. That's what the Word of God tells us to do. Knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patience and unserving endurance. And endurance fortitude develops maturity of character, proof faith, and tried integrity. And character of this sort produces the habit of joyful and confidence, hope of eternal salvation. Hallelujah. Such hope never disappoints or deludes or shames us. For God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit has, who has been given to us. How we can stand firm when people come to destroy us, when the enemies of faith come to test and try us. You know we can still love them because God's love is there. And isn't God's love unconditional? As we see, God is love. But bless God, we can make this confession of faith in the tests and trials of life. Lord, I thank you that out of my own brokenness, just as Job named his daughters, you bring beauty, peace, and a fragrant life that is pleasing to you. Glory to God. We can, we can thank you. Father, I know I'm going through some things. I know Satan's trying me, but I thank you that I'm going to go through this and my life to you is going to be beauty, peace, and a fragrant life. That is pleasing to you. And it's all about pleasing God, isn't it? Amen. 
Job pleased God. Hallelujah. And he was blessed because of it. He was blessed. Hallelujah. And bless God, we are blessed because we live a life pleasing unto God. It's about what he, he did. He did. Hallelujah. We live under a better covenant than what Job did. If Job was pleasing to him, how much better can we be pleasing to God? We fail to realize that. These were men just like we are. God's not a respected person. He loved Job as much as he loves us. And we have a better covenant. Established on better promises, glory to God. If God was endeavoring to bless Job, how much more is he endeavoring to bless us? You know who's keeping us from walking in those blessings? I just said it, us. <laughs> you. You got nobody to blame but yourself. Some of us was raised hard. Things have happened in our lives. But I think we all can say nothing as bad as what happened to Job has happened in our lives. Now, we may have lost loved ones. We may have lost possessions. But I can say I haven't come to the point where all that I had, family, friends, possessions, all were stripped away. I can't say that's happened to me. Maybe you have. I, I can't say that. But he loves us much more, hallelujah. I like, you know, my mind sometimes maybe sees things a little different than maybe your mind sees things. And it's funny how I get an illustration sometimes, but I just tell you like it is. You know, I might not have the best tact, but I think it, it gets the message across. What's the best fertilizer in the garden? Here we go again. Manure, right? Cow poo. You know, but these things we sow in the ground, we cover in cow poop, don't we? But that manure breaks down and causes that seed to germinate and gives it strength and nutrients it needs to what? To blossom, to mature. Even better than before. It can cause greater fruit to be produced, right? I'm not much of a farmer, but many of you are. But you know what? In our lives, God has planted many great things in each of our hearts. Planted within here. I... Sometimes we can't even see them. We don't recognize them. You can't see them in my life. You know, until they actually bloom, right? You plant that corn, you bury it up. Well, if you don't stake it off, you know, you could trample off foot and, and just ruin it. But it's there the whole time, working behind the scenes. But you give it time, and under the right conditions, it will mature and it'll be evident to all. You know, there's hey, each and every one of us, not just me, but each and every one of you, and you hear me preach this and preach this and preach this because I want it to get through your heads. We all have great and mighty gifts, things God's wanting to mature and blossom in our hearts. We gotta be patient. We've got to keep the ground soft and the right things in. But Satan will put all this crap into you. Satan will cover you. You think that you're just surrounded, that he's just using you, abusing you, all this stuff is happening in your life. We know that manure is not pleasant, is it? But we just think our lives, there's just crap happening here, crap, you know, everywhere. But God takes that, these things that Satan's using to destroy you and keep you down and over time will cause you to be stronger, more rooted, more planted firm in God's will and plan. And bless God, the fruit will be evident to all. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad of that? No matter what Satan throws at you, all the crap of life... Bless God. God's using it for your good. Glory to God. Let's wrap this up in Romans 8 and 28. Romans 8 and 28. Hallelujah. And we know that all A-double-L things work together for good to those who love God. Does anybody love God here this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, aren't you glad all things are working together for your good? To those who are called according to his purpose. For him he for, 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 for him he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, that these he also called, whom he called, whom he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen. 
who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor life, nor death, nor any other created thing. I think he's trying to get something across here, don't you? Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing. 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 Hallelujah. Nothing Satan can conjure up and throw against us can separate us from God's love. You know what? God's not going to remove His protection from you. Job was an example. God's, listen, listen to me. God's not going to remove His hand of protection from around you. But you know who can? Not Satan. Job, not you. You can't remove God's protection from me. Only one person. There you go. Papa God, only one person can can remove God's protection from yourself, and that's yourself. <laughs> that's by your own foolish mistakes and choices in life. But bless God, if you get out of God's fellowship, repent and get back in. Get back in, hallelujah. If you've messed up, repent. Get back in. If you're out of love, get back in. He'll accept you. He'll bring you right back in and restore that, which yourself and your ignorance even try to separate <laughs> yourself from. Hallelujah, God is love. And I'm thankful I serve a loving God Hallelujah, who cares for me affectionately, who watches over me, who protects me, and has done all for me. And the ball's in my court. The ball's in your court. You've got to do something with this message of grace. <laughs> You've got to do something with it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all bow our heads. Father, we love you and we thank you and praise you that you are good and your mercies, Father, they last forever. Thank you, Father, that you blot out our transgressions, Father, for your sake. Because, Father, you cannot look over sin. So we thank you for my sake, Father. You have forgiven me. But, Father, we thank you that we can commune with you and have a relationship with you and can walk in, these, in the blessings that, Father, you have provided for us. And, Father, we thank you that you have blessed us, Father, not so we can just hoard up for ourselves and say, look what I have, but, Father, we can take these blessings and continue to sow them into others' lives. And that, Father, that you just continue the blessing cycle over and over and over again. But we thank you for these things that are planted within our hearts. And, Father, we choose, Father, in each of our lives, Father, we go through things, you know, our family and our friends, and, and times can be trying, Father. But we thank you that your peace is always present. Your Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, Father, helper, intercessor, strengthener, stand by God, Father, he is within our hearts. And we thank you in the midst of these trials and temptations. He rises and shows himself mightily, Father, in and through us, comforts our hearts. But we choose, Father, to stay established and firm, standing upon your word, the firm and sure, Father, Thing, Father, and nothing, nothing can move us or remove us, Father, from your will. Father, but we choose, we choose continually to serve you, to be obedient to your will, surrender our lives to your calling, Father. But we thank you that just as in these tests and trials, that there's also an outcome, Father, which is to our benefit. And Father, we thank you that the latter is better than the before and that we'll come out of these things cleaner, shinier Father worth more more blessed than what we did before Father we thank you that these things just remove from us all the impurities all the contamination of this world and we become closer and more like you we love you Father we thank you for all things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's keep our heads bowed this morning, if you would.
Does anybody this morning need prayer? Father, well, maybe don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior this morning. Maybe you just need some prayer. Maybe you just need to pray for yourself. I want to give you the opportunity to come down myself or somebody else will pray with you, get in agreement with you. Maybe you don't know us. Maybe you don't know to pray as you ought to, but bless God for the Holy Spirit who does. And we can get in with one another in a prayer, prayer of agreement. And we can pray what is necessary. Hallelujah. Anybody, I want to give anybody and everybody that opportunity this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. I don't tarry too long. Unless the Holy Spirit presses upon me. Let's all stand. Glory to God. Well, this help anybody this morning? It helped me if it didn't help anybody else. You know, many times we as ministers, we preach a message that's preaching to us more than it is you anyway sometimes. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, a um, few announcements. March 21st and 22nd, David Webb's having his uh, remnant conference, 7 p.m. Friday night, March 21st, and then I think 9, they're having breakfast, is that right? The 22nd, Saturday, and uh, Joe informed me this morning that um, up, which Logan's a long way away, but what's the name of the church again? Word of Life? Word of Life Church. Um, Marty Blackwelder, which he was... Um, I've heard him many times at Rama. Great teacher, especially of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be down there April the 5th and 6th, 11 and 7 p.m. So if anybody's interested, get with Joe. He can give you more info on that. And then Jesse had something. He ain't in here. <laughs> what, what was he talking about that movie, God is Something? It's a movie that, um, it's a, I guess, a Christian-based movie, and uh, they're showing it one night. Well, we're not sure. If that was a set plan, but then I think it's, I'm not sure. It's a way, from what I understand, it's a way to, you know, show, like, the movie industry that, hey, you know, we want golly movies, and we're, we will support these things, right, basically? <laughs> All right. Um, remember Tuesday night, we continue to have Tuesday night service, teaching on the Holy Spirit. Um, anything else I might miss? All right, guys, hey, in case you didn't know, they're giving us some snow tonight, so. Huh? Eight to twelve. I'm not even going to confess that. Uh, but I think, yeah. Maybe in the mountains. I know further north you are, they're giving more than south. So, everybody stay warm. Remember, you are blessed. Walk in the blessings that are yours. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.